You know, with three minutes left in this entire fight, I'm battling the clock. And I'm willing to risk getting knocked out right here and now to push the pace and take this fight where I need it to and, and finish the fight. For me, sometimes I just realize it's fight or flight, and the option is always fight. And going into the fight with Marlos Kunin, uh, I was kind of um, a little intimidating because I remember watching her fight Cyborg and giving Cyborg a good run for her money. And I thought, man, lucky that girl fights at 145 because I definitely don't ever want to have to fight that girl. And then she dropped to 135 and a couple years passed. And before you knew it, I was up on that upper echelon also. And, and it was kind of like, you, they say you want to train until your, your icons become your rivals. And in that case, that was, that was the pinnacle of the sport. It was a Strikeforce world title. It's where the best women in the whole world were. And she was the title holder and I was fighting her. And uh, yeah, it was a little bit intimidating, but I, I believed in myself. I believed that I could do it. And, I actually tore my MCL completely, probably three and a half or four weeks before the fight. And everyone was like, you're crazy, you can't do that. You can't fight with a torn MCL. And I was like, no, no, no. I was like, you don't understand it. Like, I have it right here. Like, I already know that I've won this fight and I'm gonna do it with or without the torn MCL. I locked in the submission. It was a little, little bit more of an unorthodox submission. I had her in a head and arm triangle choke and I hopped over to the correct side and I just started putting a massive amount of pressure on that. And I heard her wheezing and I heard the breath struggling to, for her to take in that breath. And pretty soon she, she actually stopped breathing. I heard the, the, as I squeezed more and I got tighter and tighter, like a boa constrictor around her neck, like pretty soon she wasn't able to breathe at all. And I had a feeling that the, the tap was coming soon. And that was a crazy emotion. That was, you know, again, a big whirlwind that I just defeated my idol, essentially. The first time that I sort of had a, not necessarily an encounter, but kind of really started to take note of like who Rhonda was, was when she started doing interviews and she was fighting a weight class above me. And then she's like, oh, I can't make 135. And then it was like, oh, I'm gonna make 135 and I'm gonna come down there and slap that title out of her hands. And she really kind of came across as like really cocky and arrogant. And at the time, women's MMA was still like, you know, it was growing, but like most of the, the girls were really cool because it had been a hard road and we all kind of understood that. Like, we kind of stuck together in a way. There was kind of a camaraderie. Like, yes, we were fighting each other, but we were all fighting for a common cause. And so Rhonda came along and she was kind of just marching to the beat of her own drum and was different than anything that I was ever used to. And I was kind of like, whoa, where, you know, why is this chick being so disrespectful? Like, why would she say that stuff? I was like, she's just kind of come out of nowhere and she's not even in my weight division. And like, now she's talking all this smack. Like. Who is this girl? And I think it just kind of got us off, you know, on the wrong foot right away. And I kind of fired some, you know, some of my own shots back. And then, you know, from there things escalated and that's really where the rivalry began. I was a bit out of my element, honestly, because uh, I feel for me, like I've never had any real animosity towards the, the girls that I fought. It's like they're, they're opponents and I'm thankful to have them there. You know, it is a sport at the end of the day, like no hard feelings. Like, I have no problem going out there and beating someone up and then going to grab a beer afterwards. It's, you know, all cool. And when the fight's done, it's done. Um, but in this, you know, in the case of, of Rousey, it was just so different. Like the, the level of cockiness and arrogance before she even accomplished anything, you know, it's, it's one thing to be confident, but she just came across so, so different. And uh, yeah, it was just a bit uh, unfamiliar for me. definitely more emotional that day than, than normal. And I think that I just was like ill prepared to like handle that form of m mental warfare, I guess, at the time. I was really young. This is you know, back in 2012. And um, yeah, I think she kind of like got me fired up a little bit. And I went out there with kind of a hellacious pace, to be honest. Kind of went guns blazing and I cost myself the fight, putting myself into like, a putting myself into a bad position. And uh, you know, she got the arm bar and then I was like, I just refused to tap. I just let it completely go because I'm a pretty stubborn person. 
It's absolutely heartbreaking. It's gut-wrenching. It's like you feel like someone has, I don't know, it's, it's like almost as bad as a feeling as like someone stole your child from you or something. Like it's just a disgusting, disheartening feeling and it's you're sick to your stomach over it and you can't stop thinking about it. And, and then what really came to my mind is like, what can I do to change that? What can I do to better myself from this and like to make sure something like that doesn't happen again because this is an awful, awful feeling and I'm like, I gotta heal up, I gotta get back in there and I gotta fight as soon as I possibly can. I mean, Dana saying that we were never gonna fight for the UFC definitely pissed me off. I was like, really, who are you like to say that, you know? And of course, yeah, he's the president of the UFC, obviously. But like, in my mind, I still was like, that's not cool, that's not okay. And like, I, I had a chip on my shoulder. I wanted to, I wanted to prove him wrong. I, I, I had made a goal out of kind of making him eat his own words, you know? And I was like, yeah, well, you haven't seen me fight yet. Wait till you watch me fight. You don't want to have me fight for your organization. I can, I can prove that. No, the pre-fight jitters weren't anything crazy. I was very excited for that opportunity. I felt like I was well prepared, but I think I just went out and was a little bit with, with having less experience than I do now, a little bit overzealous. I just went out there and, you know, for the first two rounds, I pretty much dominated the fight. And then I just got a little bit careless for a second in the third round, and, you know, Kaz Ngano is a college wrestler, you know, on paper, she's a better wrestler than, than I am, technically. Um, you know, I don't feel that that's actually the case, but like, if you look at it on paper, she's she's got a strong wrestling background. So when she took me down, like, you know, she wore on me, and, you know, she's got a comeback fighting kind of style too. And I got kneed in the nose and I was like, hey, I'm still in it, I'm still fighting. I tried to take a shot and the referee stopped the fight and I completely disagree with that stoppage. And I, I always will. Again, another really tough moment in my career. Very gut-wrenching, very heartbreaking because it's like, you know, I've been busting my butt to like prove to the UFC like, women deserve to be in the UFC. Here's my first opportunity to showcase it. And, uh, you know, I didn't walk away with the win. So that was a very, another very hard moment. I want to be the champion. And if that is not an opportunity that will be afforded to me, no matter how many people I beat, then what am I doing this for? Dana White called me and I was running errands in Washington State and he was like, hey, can you come to Vegas? And I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, I guess, like something you can't tell me over the phone. And he was like, no, I need you to come to Vegas. And I was like, okay. And within an hour, I was on a flight, uh, you know, two, two and a half hour flight down to Vegas. And, you know, I went into the office and he proceeded to, to ask me if I wanted to be a coach on the Ultimate Fighter. And I was so excited. I was like, yes, please. I want to be a coach on the Ultimate Fighter. Um, sign me up, and uh, then that came to fruition, and that was, you know, that was an incredible experience too. I knew they were gonna set me up with something. Hi. <laughs> you know, parts of it were just really cool. I think being a coach and having the team and being the first ever female coaches to, to coach on an Ultimate Fighter, having the first season that had female competitors on that season was definitely a big mile marker for us. But at the same time, it was really exhausting because I had to spend every day around Rhonda, and she just was like such an unpleasurable person to be around. You know, cussing me out and, and like really uncalled for. It was like I, you know, like not really like I'm kind of minding my own business, and she's just kind of like insulting me. And I'm like, you know, it it is what it is. That's you know, we have a rivalry, obviously, because we don't get along. So, um, but with that being said, it was a pretty exhausting experience at the same time. I decided to just like try to be myself, like not let her dictate my mood. And you know, before that, she had dictated. You know, I'd, she'd walk in the room and I'd be like pissed off instantly. And then I was like, you know, I'm just gonna like I'm gonna stay true to myself. I'm gonna keep smiling. I'm gonna be who I want to be. But at the end of the day, it was a really long lead up and a really long drug out um, lead up to that fight. I think by the time the fight rolled around, I felt a bit flat because I had been, you know, just suppressing any of those emotions, you know, and I think I can do a, a lot better than I did in that fight. I will guys to do a clean fight, follow my orders at all times, defend yourself at all times, touch gloves and let's do this. 
No, not a chance. They swing in the middle of the octagon early. Honestly, I think I really did terrible in that fight. I don't think I showed at all what I'm capable of. And granted, I made it to the third round. I think that with a better approach and sticking to the game plan better, like I can beat that girl, you know? And it really irritates me that I have those two losses and I want to go out there and I want to seal my legacy and I want to beat Ronda Rousey. And, um, you know, I've got to go out there and do that. Like, this is just something that must happen. And I really believe that I can. I, I don't think that was really even half of my potential, like what I showed that night. She taps. Ronda Rousey remains the UFC Women's Bantamweight Champion. I don't think the best thing that came out at all. I know it didn't. I know I'm capable of so much more than that. And I'm really eager to show the, the world that. After that fight, I went on a four fight win streak and uh, the fight with Jessica, I really showed a lot of my, you know, power and accuracy and my striking and the movement being better. We got ourselves a fight. Oh, 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 hey, hey, Almost knocked her out. I think if I wouldn't have followed her to the ground, if I would have called her back up, you know, I might have been able to get a KO. But um, with that being said, uh, I've been evolving a tremendous amount as a fighter um, and gelling really well with my team, Extreme Couture. And I'm really excited that after I put that win streak together, that everything went the way that it did because it got to a point where when I was supposed to get that title after I beat Jessica I, they said, yes, this is a title elimination fight. Whoever wins this fight will be fighting, you know, Ronda for the title. So I win the fight. It goes on to be promoted as a number one contender fight. And then all of a sudden I wake up one morning and I hear an announcement that Holly Holm is now fighting Ronda Rousey and I'm out of the selection. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to be fighting Ronda. I'm not getting a title shot at the moment. And I was like, oh, like it, just another gut-wrenching experience. It's like, man, I, I'm really putting in work here. I'm really trying here, and I don't take those kinds of opportunities lightly. So that's like my whole livelihood. Like, I feel like someone just pulled the carpet out from underneath my life. And I um, wasn't very happy in that moment. And in the heat of the moment, I'm like, well, maybe I, maybe this is like my sign that I just need to walk away from this sport. Like, not because I feel like I'm not capable, not because I can't, not because I'm physically unabled, not because I don't have a desire to fight, but because I want to be the champion. And if that is not an opportunity that will be afforded to me, no matter how many people I beat, then what am I doing this for? You know, my passion and my drive is to be the best in the world. And I got really frustrated in that moment. And uh, then Holly went out and knocked out Rhonda, just brutally KO'd her. And I thought, all right, I spoke too soon. This is exactly what I needed to happen so that I could have another shot at the title. My manager was the one to call me, Josh Jones, and he called me and I said, are you sitting down? And I said, no, he said, sit down. <laughs> and I said, what's going on? Is everything okay? He said, do you want to fight Holly Holm, UFC 196? And I was like, are you kidding me? Of course I want to fight Holly. Like, I've been begging for that. And he already knew the answer to it. But you know, he had to like, make it something fun, you know? So I was like, yes, please, like, please give me that opportunity. He's like, okay. It's like the UFC is gonna, gonna put this together. You know, Ronda's not gonna be ready in the amount of time that they anticipated and Holly wants to fight, so you're up. I felt like Holly and my fight kind of flew under the radar until like the week of the fight or maybe like two weeks out and then people just got really excited about that. I think it was kind of like the pre-fight lead up was really focused on Connor. And then they were like, whoa, there's the women's title fight on here too. Hello, people, like when the posters started to come out and they, then we just like flooded with media and uh, all those obligations. So it was kind of nice though, that we didn't have to have so much obligations through the whole camp that I was able to really focus on training and you know, I'm not opposed to that at all. So it, it was actually really refreshing. Telling myself like you can beat this girl, like you're gonna beat this girl. She's just a she's just a woman standing in the way of your goal. Like you're gonna be a champion. You're gonna beat this girl. And she's like, I got this. I got this. I got this. And she's reinforcing everything that I already knew. Like I already knew I was capable of that. Um, but just you know, talking to myself, telling myself like, yes, here it is. This is your moment. Like embrace it, enjoy it, love it, 
and uh, it's pretty cool that you know, I'm one of two women on the entire planet fighting for the UFC world title. That's a pretty cool accomplishment, even in itself. You're kind of uh, like edgy the whole time, like anxious, just ready. You're ready for battle. You're preparing yourself mentally, physically, emotionally to go into battle. And not just go into battle, but go into battle in front of the whole world. You know, one of the biggest pay-per-views ever, co-main event to Conor McGregor, five rounds against undefeated Holly Holm, who just crushed Ronda Rousey, you know, who was thought to be so unbeatable by the masses. Wow, you know, it's like, hello, we have arrived, and here's the biggest opportunity of your career, and I thought, I got this. I was like, I know that I can do this. I know that this is meant to be. I know this is my opportunity, and I'm gonna go out there, and I'm gonna do what we worked on. I'm gonna stick to the game plan, and I'm gonna win this fight. Three minutes left in this entire fight and counting down, I'm battling the clock more than anything right now and I'm willing to risk getting knocked out right here and now. I want you to fight hard to fight clean. If you want to touch gloves, touch them down. Oh, nice. And she gets the takedown. Side kick to the body. Oh, nice combination by Holly. I remember in between the, the rounds, my, my head corner, Brian Caraway, comes in there and he says, you need to put your head down, you need to Mike Tyson her. <laughs> that essentially means get after it. So I was like, I went out there and I spent, you know, another minute or two trying to like find that perfect opportunity to get inside and get her down and she was not giving it to me. Like there, she wasn't making mistakes, she wasn't overextending herself. There was nothing to grab, there was nothing to shoot under. And I, I thought to myself, okay, then if she's gonna be perfect in this, like you're not gonna get an opportunity given to you. You're gonna have to make one. Even though it's scary to rush in on a fighter like Holly, because we obviously saw that she's a devastating striker and one wrong move and she can end it all right there. But I thought, I'm willing to risk that. You know, with three minutes left in this entire fight and counting down, I'm battling the clock more than anything right now. And I'm willing to risk getting knocked out right here and now to push the pace and take this fight where I need it to and, and finish the fight. There it is, there it is. Holly's trying to get right back up. She needs to. I was putting a lot of pressure on her and I knew she was gonna have to make some sort of mistake, some sort of error to get up from underneath that pressure. And I saw her neck get exposed and I grabbed it and I sunk it in and I put my hand over my chin and I was like, this is in. Like, there, there is no getting out of this. And I was like, I don't care what she does. I don't care if I have no hooks in, no, nothing. I was like, this is in. <clears throat> and the time began to slow down in my mind. It was like I, we were fighting water or mud and it was just like slow and she's like flipping me over and I'm like, man, where's this girl gonna tap out? He's like, I know I have this. He's like, please tell me she can't breathe through her ears or something crazy, you know? I was like, uh, when is she gonna tap? But the, she didn't tap, that's the crazy part. She hung on until she literally went to sleep. So she passed out. She and then I have, um, Big John McCarthy ripping me off of her, like, let go. She's she's asleep. She's out. She's tapping. She's out. Misha King is the new UFC Women's Bantamweight Champion. My God. That very moment, it's just like you just, everything comes out. And you're like, whoa, like, I can't believe this is actually, it actually happened. Like, I actually did it. Like, I am a world champion. I've done it against all odds, you know, coming in as the underdog and, you know, many people not believing that I could do it, coming in, you know, potentially down on the scorecards in the fifth round, knowing that's what I had to do and being able to do it was a very exhilarating feeling. It was just such an overwhelming feeling. I just, I couldn't, like, all I could say was thank you. I was like, thank you, thank you, thank you. I was just like, in that moment, I was like so excited and so happy. I, I don't think you could have wiped the smile off of my face. Like, it was like a perma smile. Uh, Cheshire cat grin, you know? I was ear to ear, I was happy, and uh, I felt really fulfilled. There's times when I, I look at the belt and I'm like, it's not even the belt that's so cool, it's what is represented by the belt. You know, I always believed that I would be a UFC champion, and I always believed I was capable of it, but I wanted to prove it to the rest of the world. And having that strap to carry around with me and, and to, to represent all that hard work, that's like proving it to the rest of the world. 
So all the naysayers and all the doubts, you know, doubters now, it's like, yeah, well, look at me now. Like, I, I have captured this belt, and this belt means all the hard work and all the years and the blood, sweat, and tears that went into this. That's what this means. That's what that belt means. I understand that Rhonda and my name will probably be forever linked and go down in the history books as one of the greatest rivalries ever in women's MMA history. Um, the, the pro to that is we have elevated women's mixed martial arts to the next level. It was our fight together, takes two of us to tango, that changed the mind of Dana White. We are the, you know, both of us are the reason why women got accepted into the UFC. And uh, through this long journey that I've been going through, the 10 years that I've been fighting, um, I feel very lucky to have a rival, a rival like Rhonda. Like, even though I obviously can't stand the girl, I am thankful to have that because I think every great story that you really see, you know, every Rocky Balboa story or anything like that, there's always some rivalry and, and that has really elevated the sport of women's mixed martial arts. And it makes it fun for the fans, like the fans are invested, they are invested in this. So I'm thankful that I have someone like Rhonda to, to push me, to motivate me and, and to have like such an epic rivalry with. I've seen over the past decade the perception of of women and women in combat sports change dramatically. And a huge part of that has to do with being on an equal playing field in the UFC and being right there next to our male counterparts with the same opportunity to shine on the biggest platforms. And it's really cool that I've, I've personally got to experience the worst of it and I've gotten to experience the highest and the best of it. And um, I am really, really honored and proud to be able to say that you know, I had a piece, I had a part to do with that perception change of the general public and the way that they view women and what we're capable of. And hopefully, I've inspired a lot of youth, uh, young young uh, people to, to fi find their passion, to follow their passion, whatever it may be, and um, to, to continue to change the perception of, of what women are capable of and empowering women. I love that.